Welcome to Recovery Uncovered, your all things recovery podcast. Recovery Uncovered is produced by MHAB Enterprises, a division of the Northeast Group of Companies located right here in Plattsburgh, New York. I'm your host, Mike Carpenter. Affectionately known as MHAB Mike, and I'm your co-host, Betsy Vicencio. Affectionately known as BV the Normie. We have one goal in these podcasts, and that's not to suck. Thanks for tuning in. Good morning. Welcome to Recovery Uncovered. I'm Mike Carpenter, also known as MHAB Mike, and I'm your host for today's podcast. This is my sidekick and co-host, Betsy Vicenzio, also known as BV the Normie. How are you doing today, BV? Awesome. How are you doing, Mike? I'm doing good. Affectionately known as MHAB Mike. MHAB Mike. I'm feeling affectionate toward you today. This is episode three of our podcast. We don't have a we don't have a colorful name for this one yet. I couldn't think of anything this morning, so we'll call it the politics of recovery, I guess, or politics and recovery. And I want to take a couple minutes just to tell you what's going on, and then we have our very first guest today. We're very, very, very excited. We, uh, you know, as I've said in past podcasts, I've been in recovery for thirty plus years doing this, and I've watched a lot of things go on over the time that I've been here, and. And uh, one of the things is getting people that hold elected office and officials that are in charge of money being spent to understand what the recovery movement is and what we're trying to do, what MHAB was about. And so we thought it was important that early on we brought somebody in that could speak to what's going on in New York State. So I'm not going to give you a long, do- a long monologue about what I think, and I'm just going to introduce our guest today. We have assemblymen from our district, and our district encompasses... Quite a large uh, area, I think. Clinton, Essex, Franklin. Clinton, Franklin, parts of St. Lawrence County. No Essex? No Essex. Oh, Used to be okay. Essex, now we got Essex Is it out. District 117? Is that 115. 115. I was so close. Damn, I, my They've God. done a lot of background check. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, maybe the details a little shy, So let me finish the introduction <laughs> before we ask him who he represents. This is our very dear friend that I... I say that in, in, in jest and with all love, D. Billy Jones, Assemblyman from this district. Billy, thanks for coming and being our first guest. Great to be here. Yeah. Great to be the first guest. Well, I'll let you know how great it is after <laughs> the... <laughs> We've assured Billy that he says anything. if he says anything that he doesn't want on camera, we might allow him to take it out yeah. or we might just hold it over him. So yeah. we'll see how that goes. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> so, Billy... I met you a few years ago mm-hmm. when we got involved in the Spark Co- when I got involved in the Spark Coalition, yep. and I want to tell you a kind of personal story about one of the first times I met you. I'm on the Spark Steering Committee, and the meetings are held at the United Way. And your good friend and mine, John Bernardi, was mm-hmm. hosting the meeting, and he said, "We're bringing Billy Jones in, the new Assemblyman, and he's going to talk to us about you know what the state's going to do." And you came in, and and we're sitting around the table, and John said, "So, you know, Billy, what can you tell us about what's going on, and what do you think about you know recovery in this?" And you looked at all of us and said, "You know what? I didn't come to talk. I came to listen to all of you." And I think in the 57 years I've been alive, that's the first time I heard an elected official say, "I don't want to talk. I want to listen." So I was very enamored with the fact that we had somebody who actually wanted to hear what we were talking about. And I think we voiced a lot of things. And and over the time, we asked you for an awful lot of help with things. And and you've been gracious and helpful and and a real proponent of that. So I'd like to just ask you generally, what's your feel about maybe the Spark Coalition recovery in this area in general, the things that we're doing as a community with regards to that? Well, I personally think it's one of the more impressive things that I have seen. Um, I started coming to Spark events or meetings before I was elected to this office while I was still Franklin County uh, chair and um, just the coalition that you brought together. I mean, law enforcement, people in recovery, um, you know, experts in the field, health, uh, people in health, um, counselors, business people, just anybody that could help out the process, get together and speak. And it was very impressive. And I will say, when when I did meet you, I actually met you on the campaign trail, <laughs> and you were like, 
uh, well, you're just a politician running to get elected and, uh, you know, I don't know, you're going to have to prove yourself to me. <laughs> Typical Mike Carpenter <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and because uh, Betsy was all like, hi, hi, how are you doing? This is Mike. And it's like, oh, geez, this thing's going to be a tough one. But and, and you're right. When I was running for this office, I didn't know anything about it. Politicians, I'm going to be very blunt here, they hit the points. Obviously, um, you know, uh, the opioid addiction was was ha big at that time. Not that it's not still big, but it was, you know, it was here and it was one of the major issues of the campaign. And as politicians, we all say these talking points, you know, we're going to do this or we're going to help out. But none of us get it until we're actually in it. And and we, we, we invest time to go in it. And I will say at that point, I didn't know a lot about it. And uh, when John invited me to the steering committee, the Spark Steering Committee, I didn't know a lot about it. And uh, over the past four years, I've, I've kind of embedded myself into the, uh, you know, into the treatment and recovery community because you kept saying it's, you know, so much emphasis is on the treatment side of it. And I remember the, one of our first conversations we had, you said it it's, seems to be all about treatment and that's important, but the recovery side of it, you're gonna be in recovery a lot more uh, or or it invest a lot more of your time in recovery than you are in treatment. So let's get some more concentration towards that. And that really, you know, that, you continue to floor me. me with the fact that you listen to I, what I yeah, actually I, said I, to you over the years. It, I'm just, and I remember I, that. I continue to just be, be yeah. shocked. Be yeah. Shocked so I mean, I, obviously, I've been to several events. I've talked to. Um, people in the field, but talk to family members, talk to the people in the recovery and what works and what doesn't. And New York State doesn't, they still don't know. They, there's no perfect solution to that. But I will say, um, the more we get to learn about it or um, we experience what, pe we'll never experience what people are going through, but we get an insight in what they're going through. I think it helps. Um, there is no magic bullet, so to speak. You you told me that right off. Every individual is different. Yeah. Um, every uh, solution may be, a li may be different, maybe a little different, maybe a lot different, but um, you know, you have to figure out um, what works for people, you know, individuals. One of, <clears throat> one of the things we did at the Spark Coalition early on when I, when I got on there is I said, there's this, there's this misunderstanding amongst the business community about what people in recovery are and about how you deal with people, employees, and how we get employees to be able to go to work. And, you know, if you think about it, if you're a factory environment and you hire entry level people, which is what a lot of people in recovery are, not everybody, but there's a, a fair number of them have a, a checkered history, a checkered work history, a criminal history, those types of things. And so we said we wanted to bring people together and talk about that. So we put a group together and we brought a bunch of business leaders, a bunch of law enforcement, uh, a bunch of treatment providers we left politicians out because we wanted to do it amongst yeah. the the people and then make a presentation to you guys and one of the things i talked to you about is how do we get people employed it's such an important yeah. component of it and i remember you and i had lunch one day and i tried to buy you lunch which you refused and yes. wouldn't allow me to do it so you <laughs> buy you buy you buy your own lunch but i, I wanted to buy a bunch and he wouldn't do it I, which hurt me yeah. personally yeah, then you like, went well, off on really <laughs> right really? Like, I, can't I can't buy you lunch your a lot more going lunch. on in the world billy uh, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so we had lunch one day and we talked about what we could do and i understand through that conversation and then some hard work by you and the governor mm -hmm. we put together or you guys put together a bill to offer some tax incentive. You want to talk a little yeah, bit about that? Yeah, sure. And, and I will say, um, going back to Spark and putting that together, and I remember um, that being brought together. And I think, you know, we talk about the stigma behind it. That had a yeah. lot to do with it. And I remember being invited back in with all the businesses there and people in recovery and obviously, uh, you know, treatment specialists and and people that, that run um, recovery uh, operations, I shouldn't say operations, but um, I remember going back there and I was like, what are we going to, what are we getting out of this? Because that was early on in, in my career as an assembly person. And it was all about, we have to get the stigma out of the way, but we also have to have an incentive for some of these businesses. Yeah. Because as you mentioned, it's not easy to hire somebody in recovery. You're, you're, you're in business and you're in recovery. You have the unique, you know, uh, both sides of that. But um, so we went out to lunch and I tell this story very often that you, you sprung this idea on me and I was like, wow, that's a pretty good idea. 
And once in a while, when politicians get an idea, they actually follow through <laughs> on making it, making it a reality. Sure. And and we made it a reality. Um, we pushed for it. The governor did um, finally put my bill into his into his budget. We we passed the budget, uh, the assembly and the senate, and um, it became uh, became law and it became a, a program. And uh, I think it's worked out very successfully. You would know more about We've that. Used to me. How many we, have so we had, Betsy? Betsy can probably speak to the actual numbers we've used yeah. as a business. And you're right. I think before Betsy talked, I, I think for us, we were already a business hiring people in recovery. Yeah. We we understood what it took. But when you and I spoke, I said, if you're just a business and you have two applicants and one applicant has never had a drug or alcohol problem mm -hmm. and the other has and everything else is equal, the chances are most employers are going to side with this person yeah. who hasn't because of the other problem. So we thought if we did something that went to their pocketbook, not to, yeah. that yeah. that would be to the incentivize them. And like it. you that's, said, that's you're right. very blunt yes. about it. It yeah. is a, it is a bit of pain of a pain in the ass to yeah. hire yeah. somebody in recovery, but we obviously want to give people a chance for one thing. And number two, you know, you're in business. We need employees here. Sure. So why are we, you know, not using a population of people that want to work on um, that, that can be very uh, successful and useful um, and we've had society. some employers here in this area that are going to come and be guests here because they bought into this and yeah. they've used that bill. They've done things because they looked at it and said, we can't get employees. If this is another pool of people that we can pick from, this yeah. is giving us a leg up on yeah. the other employers who are unwilling to yeah. do Great this. Great employers that have made huge accommodations for employees that are in recovery because the, you know, from the employer standpoint, the, you know, the costs have to do with the time it takes for somebody early on in recovery. Exactly to have to go to appointments, to have to, you know, whether they're medical appointments, mm -hmm. probation appointments. We have employers that have worked collaboratively to bring um, both treatment providers as well as law enforcement in so that probation will come to the workplace sure. so their employee doesn't have to leave. Many people don't have transportation, so uh, a 30-minute meeting with your probation officer could entail a one-hour taxi ride yeah. to and then back. And so this bill in particular gives the employer an opportunity to defray some of those costs for the time that an employee misses mm -hmm. to be able to actually execute those things that are essential to their recovery. And, and to be an employer that's supportive of people in recovery, and we've done, I think, an extraordinary job with the number of people that we have that are in recovery. But we have, um, I believe we have six people that we are filing for the recovery, New York State Recovery mm -hmm. Tax Credit this year, this year alone, and I think we had two last year. So I feel really great about. And I the think fact you were one of the first to do it. I mean, we had a little little sign, a little, little ceremony. ceremony. Yep, with, we absolutely with did. With the young gentleman that that was one of the first to do it. So, you um, know, if you made that bill retroactive, we could get more than six. Yeah. <laughs> if you go back <laughs> ten years, I could get a hell of a lot more than six, well, Billy. Well, <laughs> no, and I think you made it, uh, the point that we were talking about, and I don't think a lot of people think of that. And 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 Mike is is exactly right. He's like, if you are an employer that you know you have these these two candidates and one of them is in recovery there was a sense in the past that maybe we just didn't want to one deal with it or take a chance but i think a lot of companies in, in this area have done that mm -hmm. and we can hope that that bill has incentivized them to do that and i think you have done that as well by showing other companies other uh, businesses that you can do this and be successful. Sure. You know, sure. it, it's it's all about the stigma of it, but you have actually shown that it can be successful. So I'd like to speak to that for a minute that, you know, because the stigma side is so much of what we're trying to help eradicate by kind of uncovering all of these kind of little dark details about recovery from both the the person in recovery and as well as the rest of us. But you can show up as a new employee and not in your interview want to say, oh, by the way, you know, once a week for the next three months, I have an appointment that I have to go to. What you do is you get started on the job and then you call in sick and say, or call in, I'm going to be late to work when you're seven days, five days, three days on the job. And because you're, you know, you're just too embarrassed to share what, the, you know, what your current condition is. Bills like this, conversations like this allow people in early recovery to not have to hide from shame, to actually find out what resources are available, what paths are available, what employers are willing to take a chance. 
And I will say that from our personal experience, the people that have come through recovery that have uh, you know, really kind of become part of our family are, are incredible, loyal, dedicated employees that just needed a chance to get their legs back underneath them, whether they continue to work for us or have gone off to brighter pastures um, here in the North Country. So yeah, we have some, works. we have employees that have been with us that are in recovery and have been with us for, you know, many years. Yeah and have climbed the ladder into decent positions and you know they become productive members of society, homeowners, taxpayers, they help other people. So it does happen and, and the eradication of the stigma I think is important and I won't put you on the spot to ask specifics but is the bill does the bill seem to be working across the state does it seem to be you know is there engagement across the state for people I, I using believe it? there is I have not heard where you know there, there hasn't we, we don't have statistics on it yet or or specifics but um, I it's pretty to, new. I mean, I think it uh, yeah. takes a program like this some time to be able to get its yeah, legs underneath sure. us for it to become familiar. And I think for employers to realize that it, you know, that how to and execute we, and, how, and to make it work. We had something that kind of sidetracked us. And uh, when was it? In, in March <laughs> that kind of, you know, might have sidetracked. But pr talking that pre-pandemic, our unemployment rate was what? Around here was less than 3%. Yeah. And uh, that in, in itself... Um, I won't say forces. Well, it does. It forces business to look outside the box, think outside the box, and say, you know what? Um, I I'm going to give you a chance. And maybe some other er some other times that where maybe they wouldn't have. One of the big employers in this area said exactly that to me. The gentleman who runs it said, this really is giving us a pool of people that yeah. we haven't picked from that a lot of other people are not willing to pick yeah. from. So they have absolutely em embraced uh, that idea. So in the world of politics, and, and I know that there's budget issues in New York yep. State, will that is that bill funded long term? Is it done on a yearly basis? It's is done it on a yearly basis, but we're going to, you know, we're going to fight to put it in there. Um, it's not like mo it's money out of New York State's pocket up front. It, it you know, it is a tax credit um, for businesses. But as you've brought up or I've brought up that uh, we're going through some very tough budget times right now, but this program is one that just can't go away. It can't be, um, you know, put to the side. Um, I will also say about, um, you know, the o OASIS funding and in those those uh, funding resources, there's been talk of 20, 30 percent cuts. We can't let that happen either. Hopefully, um, you know, pivoting back to the federal stimulus money coming in, that will help New York State. We were in a, in a position earlier in the year where there was going to be a 30 percent cut there. We fought it back to get it to 20 percent. I know that's not great. It's kind of like, yeah, we're not going to hurt you as bad. Right. But we continue to, to, to fight on that front. And hopefully um, with the budget talks coming up and the new stimulus bill for direct state can I ask a and question local about, aid, we can we, we can close that gap. Can I ask a question about the conversations that happen down at the state level when you talk about health care cuts and in particular cuts in you know program the Oasis program or OMH? Is the conversation that there's waste of that percentage in those industries, or is the talk that we just can't afford to fund it at the levels they're at? I mean, what's the what's the real kind of the what's the story that I goes think, along with I that? I think a lot of it is we just can't fund um, at the levels they're at, which you know, it is unfortunate because um, I feel a lot of these programs are investing at the front end instead of the back end. Yeah. Let's just, you know, let's sure. just say that. Sure. And um, I, I would say when they're, when they're doing cuts, everybody talks about fraud and waste. Everybody talks about fraud and waste. You know, you hear it from my colleagues all the time. Certainly we want to root that out, but I think a more efficient system is the way to go about it. Not everything is fraudulent and not everything appears to be fraudulent it's just maybe let's concentrate on how we make things more efficient instead well, and I, of <clears throat> I think with of, regards to the cuts and I, I think they were done by executive order on three month yep. increments where the, the governor said I think the Office of Mental Health and Oasis was mandated that they go to the providers and say you have to take a 20% cut. And if I remember, there was some specific criteria and they're doing it on three months, you know, three months at a time. And we're still in that. And, and you know, the issue is that, first off, we're actually talking now, and this is the this is you and I have had this conversation. Mm -hmm. This is where you get into the debate about treatment and recovery. Yep. You know, the the truth is recovery doesn't have a huge cost to it. If you can get people through the treatment part and into actual recovery, there's not a lot of cost 
with regards to that. Most of the costs that we're talking about for Oasis and OMH are those upfront early treatment costs. And without being too political about it, the the providers in this field are not, there's not a lot of waste and fraud that's yeah. going on. They're running on pretty tight staffs. Right. They're running on, uh, you know, pretty Struggle low pay for what they're asking to people to do. And so, and I and I get that. Listen, this is a passion to me. I'm I'm in recovery. I love recovery. I love the people that are in it. And I know that somebody who has, you know, who had cancer or a family member died of cancer is going to say, well, don't cut cancer funding. And somebody's, you know, everybody has something that's passionate to them. So we're trying to be understanding. But it does seem to be a pretty big hit that long term could provide uh, more issues down the road. You know, the the funny thing, and I'd I'd love your take on this, and I, I think I know where you stand. What the pandemic has done is forced isolation. Yeah. It's, you know, we're asking people to stay home, we're asking people to not leave. And for people that are kind of well-adjusted, normal people like Betsy or you, that's- He just called, that's, us, he just called us that's, well-adjusted and normal, Billy. I just want you to know. <laughs> Speaking All for right, myself. So for, for pseudo, for kind of somewhat yeah, normal people yeah. like you and Betsy, I think yeah. that I think that it's bad, but you're able to live in it. When you take somebody that's in early recovery, typically, but even people that are in long-term recovery, the inability to be connected with people is really causing uh, an awful lot of stress. And the stress for people that are in recovery ultimately results in us going back to uh, drug or alcohol use. And I've seen it in recovery. I've seen it with, with friends of mine that have been sober for long periods of time that just can't take the isolation yeah. and made that choice to go back. And and that's frightening to me yeah. that that that's happening. So, you know, with regards to that, we're, we're happy that we've been able to keep you know, some personal interaction at our campus open. Um, but it's it's been a real struggle with the pandemic. So you almost have this double whammy. We're going to cut funding and long term, we're going to pay a worse price that's going to cost us more yeah. because maybe we didn't think about yeah. it. And, and on overall. top of that, uh, I mean, I've seen it myself, more people, uh, not only the people that are already in recovery or have just, you know, just gotten out of treatment, um, there is a growing number of people that, you know, that are feeling the stress behind um, the pandemic. They're home alone or they're home cooped up in the house with 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 people and, and and we all love our families but sometimes we need a little stress reliever and some people can't you know they, they deal with it in different ways right. and I, I you know it's no surprise that number of people on chemical dependency yeah. you know alcoholism is is has risen it's during growing. the pandemic yep. yeah we're uh, seeing, not only right. are we seeing the people in recovery we're seeing New, you know, yep. sure. A, a people new, struggling with depression. Of that. Yeah. You're seeing you know? high, you know, higher rates of domestic violence, higher yeah. suicide rates. I mean, it's depression. All, yeah. Depression, it's all depression is out. real. To Not, even of the most well-adjusted people, yeah. this pandemic has had its strain on anybody and yeah. on everybody. Yeah. And uh, I do have a question for yeah. you on that. Um, have you seen where technology can can help out in that at all? Yeah. Where so, you know, just getting somebody connected via Zoom or or. Cool. So it's a it's an interesting right. dynamic, you know. The the world of Zoom has certainly been helpful, and yeah. it's certainly filled in. And if you if you think about recovery, and we talked about this last week at the podcast, if you think about recovery in terms of, um, you know, it's really connection. Pe- people in mm-hmm. there's a, a there's a lot of different ways to be in recovery, but the lion's share of them all say that you have to have connectivity with like minded people, yeah. whether that's twelve step programs, non twelve step programs, faith based, whatever. Everybody needs that connectivity. So that inability to connect has made it tough. Zoom or the other platforms have certainly served a purpose, and prob- I would say probably maybe half or a little more than half of the people that I personally know in recovery have now gotten comfortable doing Zoom interaction and things like that. So it certainly has been beneficial. It is different. It is yeah. different than being able to have that you know face-to-face yeah. uh, human interaction. For the people that have been around a long time and we have friends that we've known for a lot of years, it's a little different. Those newer people, the whole Zoom platform has been a struggle, as well as the older people. And, and yeah. you know, I don't want to talk about things that aren't necessarily recovery, but the lack of broadband up yeah. here. Well, the, I was going to lead into know, that as well. I for, mean, we can talk about yeah. um, the lack. We always talk about the lack of broadband, you know, affecting education. We've seen it with the distance learning more and more. I've been screaming about this for uh, you know, over 10 years in this area, you know, economic development, helping our businesses, connecting um, our f- loved ones to the, you know, wh- people that live away from here, um, 
you know, just connecting us to the world, getting us in the 21st century. Here we are in 2020. One and the North Country really is not connected the way it should be. Right. Um, but let's throw in recovery into yeah. that, and um, you know that that's that certainly needs to be in the conversation as well. Right. When you have the issue with you know transportation, poverty, yeah, uh, you know lack of internet access, all of those things, it's just the perfect storm of yeah. things. And you know it's not really anybody's fault. And you know the pandemic just is a pandemic, yeah. and but it, it has really made it made it tough on the recovery community. Yeah. Um, but you're right. Yes, technology certainly has had some impact on uh, on there, that. There's no easy solution for broad solving the broadband problem. I mean, the geography makes it limiting. Yeah. The lack of population up here, you know, limits what the you know the cost or the money that's available to pay for that type of infrastructure. Yeah. But it's essential. But it almost yeah. I think I read somewhere the other day that it it really is a utility now. It, oh, it's yeah. it's it's this akin to electricity and water and things. For sure. It's and not, that's you the, know that that's the point we finally yeah. make. And I was I was on a uh, on a conference call with my colleagues uh, early on or well probably in the summer and our infrastructure really needs upgrading as well even in populated areas i mean it's this really been a strain on this during the pandemic and people were starting to talk about my colleagues even from new york new york city we're talking about you know the lack of having efficient internet broadband service and i was like wow really I mean, in urban areas. Right, you wouldn't I, think of it in yeah, that area. You think and, of it in, and I had just said, well, one of my colleagues got on and said, well, you know, with this distance learning, the broadband, we need to upgrade and we need to get people. And I'm like, I've been screaming about this huh. for 10 years. And thank Isn't you. That funny? I, I actually made a smart ass comment. And I said, wow, <laughs> there's a good idea. Yeah, let's, <laughs> you know, let's talk about that. Let's, let's get some funding behind that as well. So, you know, I think that that, I think all these things that we're talking about and doing have been good. You know, I was at the Stand Up for Recovery Day that the uh, Re recovery group for New York puts on every yep. year, and you know where they march on the Capitol. And I came down, and you guys came and mm -hmm. uh, and spoke and met with some people there. Seems like ten years ago now. It does, it? That it was, was last, last year. year. That was Probably actually last, last year. February, last February. Been, right? yeah. yeah, it's coming wow. up as a virtual one again wow. this year, I believe. Yeah. So they won't be. They won't be storming the Capitol, pardon the pun. They'll <laughs> yeah. just be, uh, you know, they'll be virtually <laughs> storming yeah. the Capitol. Be careful what you say. Yeah, 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 exactly <laughs> right. I don't, I don't, we don't want to incite <laughs> any kind yes. of But I, I think that there were maybe a dozen or so members of the assembly that came and, yeah. and spoke to us. And, and what's your gut feeling about the other members, you know, your colleagues with regards to recovery and the understanding? And I, I know that the opiate crisis really pushed it, it, it put this in the forefront. And whether we like it or not, the, the opiate crisis affected a different class of people than, say, the crack epidemic yeah. did. So, you know, society was more willing to do something about it. And so what's your gut feel about, you know, how the my, assembly feels about my it? My gut feeling about it is uh, mo a lot of my colleagues um, care about this. But it, it, it's kind of, and, and I know this is going to sound shallow, and I don't want it to, but it's it is a, you know, each member has so many issues coming at them, and I think you uh, you probably heard from a a, um, a colleague of mine there, who's unfortunately his his his, uh, his one of his kids had had passed away from it. Um, uh, I won't mention his name right now. I don't. He, he talks about it right, uh, openly about it. Um, he's in recovery himself. One of his kids um, had passed away, and he um, uh, his other. Uh, daughter, I believe, was in treatment actually when we were talking, you know, after a couple of times. But I think if when it, and, and like I said, I don't want to sound shallow, but each member picks up certain Id of certain issues that mean dear, near and dear to their heart. And I think when the when the conversation comes up, we talk about it in conference. Yes, no, we shouldn't cut that. But I I think there's, you know, fewer people that are more passionate about it than than others. Um, I would put myself in that to more passionate about it. Um, but, you know, some people you were talking about, some people, you know, their, their, their issue, their, their, their go to, or I hate to even use that word, but um, one of their passions might be cancer, you know, because they had a, a mother, a brother, a sister um, affected by it, or, you know, maybe uh, education or other issues that come up like this. And I think it depends on how passionate you are about it. I will say the assembly uh, majority 
um, when we bring it up in conference, we try to fund it um, as much as we can. I know um, it's just putting the, the resources behind that passion depends on how you can get more people on board with it. Well, I'm going to do you know. something that I never thought I would do and certainly didn't think I'd do in front of a camera is I'm going to give an elected official a compliment. Oh, so when I, when I came down to your when I, when I came down to your office last year for that day in recovery and, and Molly uh, said, come on up to the office and visit with us for a while. So I went in the building. I'm not familiar with the Capitol Hall or whatever, but the number of people representing different organizations that were there on that day lined up outside yeah. of assembly members' offices was I was floored by it. I, yeah. I literally was walking through here going, oh my God, is this what, I mean, is this what yeah. goes on, you know, at the Capitol? And and so yes. I think a lot of us, almost the same way that people don't understand necessarily what recovery is, those of us that don't work in your field, yeah. we, we may not really understand all of the things that you go through. So my hat's yeah. off to you yeah. for being, you know, a man of the people here <laughs> and doing that. But it was, it was just an interesting dynamic yeah. when I was there to see yeah how many different ways you're tugged. And so I think we all understand that and we all say, okay, we just have to be realistic about this. What can we get, you know, yeah. what do we do going forward? And one of the things that you and I have spoke about and you've been a huge supporter of our MHAB Life Skills yep. Campus. And you know, the MHAB Life Skills Campus has done some really great things in the two years that that we've been open. And, and we've been talking about what recovery housing is. And there's kind of this, uh, a little bit of a misunderstanding amongst people that operate what we call recovery housing. And you know, the truth is, you know, Oasis has certification yeah. and you can be a certified or registered registered Oasis uh, recovery house or halfway house. And then you have all of these other houses that really are nothing more than landlords. And one of the problems, there, there's two issues that go on in the world of recovering housing, Billy. One is the whole idea of MAT. And for people that don't know, MAT is medically assisted treatment. And you know, are we in recovery houses allowing people that are on medically assisted treatment to be there or not? And the guidelines from the federal government, SAMHSA, say that you can't not accept somebody who's on medically assisted treatment. Yeah. I can assure you there are some recovery houses that are not doing that, mm -hmm. uh, not only in New York State, but all over. Um, and then the second piece is, what do you do with somebody when and if they relapse, and that's part of early recovery. And if you have a house with six, eight, 10, or in our case, 40 or 50 people, and you have one or two people that go back to using, they become detrimental to everybody else. But as just sure. a landlord, you don't have the right to get rid of them. So there's a group of us that are working to put together some criteria and hopefully present to you guys that mm -hmm. would be able to become um, you know, some type of a law that would, would govern these. Do you have any information on how the assembly thinks about that? Well, we had talked about it earlier and we had actually brought our, our your concerns and in, yeah. in, in other recovery places concerns to that. Um, we're working on that. We're, we certainly want to make sure that places like MHAB um, that are unique um, in New York state, that they aren't, you know, they aren't bogged down by certain regulations that are going to affect, um, uh, affect your, 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 your place of recovery. Um, and I believe there's a couple bills out there that we don't like, um, too well, um, that would certainly have a negative impact on you or an unfair impact on, on, on your business. So we're trying to fight that. We are trying to get the task force going or trying to get, um, places like your your recovery uh, uh, campus at the table so you can actually be part of the policy making that will help uh, help your, your you do this so um, there is conversation about that there are a couple of uh, bills in legislation or, or uh, bills in proposed out there for that and we, we need to see um, them come through in this session yeah that's an important thing being able you know, I, I think what it is for people that are running recovery houses where we're not necessarily getting funding from Oasis, although we did get funding, you know, and we're very thankful for help with MHAB, but we don't get regular ongoing funding. You know, so we're getting what amounts to rent and we're trying to do as much as we can to help the people. So it's funny because it almost sounds like we're asking or we're looking for favoritism or to be different. What we're really saying is that the long and short of it is we want to live by the rules that everybody has to live by, but it becomes so detrimental when one person who's living in a community goes back to using sure. and all the other people that have 30, 60, 90, 120 days of sobriety are trying to stay sober. Well, this one other person has said, never mind, I don't care, I'm going to go back to using. And, yeah. you know, so, Again, we look at it and say, I think most times, most 
elected officials don't necessarily have a longer view of what's yeah. going on. It's really, you know, what's going on in the moment. We're trying to look at it with that longer view. Like, yeah. what do we do to make sure that this well, is good for everybody? That's part of the policy, too. And I, I know uh, when people are sitting down and just as I had said before, before I got involved in this and before you you had me on speed dial. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't know about that. And if you're sitting down there and you're a policymaker in, in Albany or you're, you're trying to make legislation, you look at some of this stuff and you say, well, yeah, that makes sense. You know, it's it, but where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, maybe it doesn't make sense in a lot of instances, you know, and that's why we need to bring more people in and, and we should get together with uh, Chair Stack now and, 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 and you know, float these ideas uh, to him, and uh, hopefully we can get some legislation through on it. it, it like I said, it's, it's all about getting people like me to understand what you're trying to do and make it as simple as possible for you to do that. You know, I think you are on speed dial, but I think I sent you like a really nice text a week ago said thank you and never heard back from you at all. I'm like, well, well we, I gave Billy a compliment yeah, about how great a job he's doing and they never well, even we responded were, we were to it. We are going through a little rough day that day, so uh, <laughs> it's an ever-evolving situation. Speed dial's only good if you return the calls. Like, it doesn't really matter if I... <laughs> no, I'm sorry, you Betsy, that, go That's ahead. all right. I think that... I bet you return her calls, don't you? <laughs> don't you? Yeah, yeah right. that's what happens. Yeah, no, right. no, I get it. Molly was on that text. <laughs> <laughs> we won't say whether or not Billy and I have any kind of an ongoing communication. We'll Whatever. leave that. Um, I think that understanding recovery, there's two sides to this. And, and once I, again, I go back to the stigma. One, one, it's a very personal journey for so many people. Mm -hmm. And so being able to get the stories out of the challenges or struggles that might be might be a bigger problem only happen when more people are willing to talk about their recovery journey. And I know I compliment you all the time about that day at the United Way when you stood up as a community leader and talked about your recovery journey and how that opened the doors for so many people to begin to share their own personal experiences. Mm -hmm. And that reduced, that step alone reduced the stigma about recovery in a way that really teed up so many conversations that allow people like Billy, other lawmakers to be open and receptive to these conversations. And for us to be able to, to talk more openly about problems that people that are trying to solve this opioid crisis or addiction as a crisis and, and understanding that there's more than just throwing money at it. Some of it is really some of the, you know, the, the, the laws or the infrastructure that supports actions that support that movement and things that are different from the way that they've mm -hmm. been done before. So one, I compliment you for as always for that effort that you made to help us start these conversations too. I thank you for always being available to be in the conversations. It's a long story. Recovery is a long road and it's not, it's not a simple one because it's not it's, a bullet point. No, like, it's uh, not. like a politician. We like, we like clean I bullet know, points and then it's not. And, 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 and well said, once you start humanizing it yes. and you start um, understanding what people are going through, you know, the first thing they have is obviously, uh, you know, it's detrimental to their health and to their family's health. The second part or the third part even is the stigma behind it. And I was there that day. And, and if you remember my story behind it, here I was, I was the uh, chair of the of the campaign yep. committee. Yep. And I was like, yes, I got a room full of 300 people. I was a little nervous anyway. I had, uh, it was five or six, six, seven years ago. And uh I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna nail this. So I got <laughs> up and I, I nailed the room full of. It was at the campaign kickoff breakfast, yep, actually. Yeah, it was the United Way. And here breakfast. this guy comes along, right after me, no notes, no anything, and just tells his story, told his story, and everybody in the room was just like, you know, just so involved in that, and he, and, and he did, and that that was just uh, uh, opened the door for so many people. Uh, I, it really did, yeah. that you could get up there being a successful a business person in this community, you know, a well-known uh, family, and that you could get up there and tell your story. Um, it really was. It was. Uh, I think it was a it defining was amazing moment. And it was inspiring it really at the was. same time. I think we look at it and, and you just go, you know, it, for so long, it, you know, if you go back and think about like the crack epidemic of the 80s, you know, mm -hmm. the crack epidemic was 
concentrated highly in inner cities. It was, you know, mostly poor people who were below that poverty Mike, line. Mike, let's face it, it was those people. It was those, those people. people. It exactly doesn't affect right. us. It's doesn't those affect, people. It doesn't affect us. Yeah. And, and for so long, there's always been that kind of differentiation. And, you know, what we're starting to do now is we're starting to get people who are just mainstream people that you wouldn't even know they're in recovery if they weren't willing to tell their story because yeah. they're just living a normal life. They've, yeah. you know, become honest. You know, I, I was telling you earlier about the couple that works for us that, you know, these people were involved in the criminal justice system, lost their kids, the whole, you know, all the things that go with this. And, you know, today they raise their children and they own a home in Plattsburgh and they pay taxes and they come to work every day and they're honest and helpful to other people. So when you actually can demonstrate to people that we do change. Those yeah. of us who live like this actually do change and become different people. And what we need is we don't we don't need necessarily a handout or any of that. We just need understanding, compassion, empathy, and uh, the ability for people to work with us. Yeah. That's what we're looking for. And and I think you know we've done some good stuff, Billy, with the stigma piece. We really have. And I, I remember I think I even talked to you about this one day that stigma. Oftentimes stigma gets that somebody who doesn't understand recovery stigmatizes people in recovery. But make no mistake, people in recovery and typically early recovery stigmatize other people. So yeah. early recovery looks at Billy Jones and goes, that guy doesn't care about me. He's a, you know, he's in this big office in Albany and he does all that. And I think what we began to see is that neither of those two things are true. Like people that are that have achieved some success aren't yeah. necessarily looking down at everybody that's had a drug problem. And people that have a drug or alcohol problem aren't necessarily looking at people going, that guy doesn't care about me. So we're starting yeah. to bridge the gap, which is very exciting to me. I get, you know, that that piece for me means about the most of anything that Definitely. that we could do. I don't think there is anybody that any of us know that has not been impacted by addiction in their family, whether it's alcoholism, yeah. whether it's drug addiction, whether it's crack, whether it's the opioid epidemic. There is not a there's not a person that you or I know that has not been impacted. The question is whether they know or they know enough or are willing to talk enough about what they know. Well, we say it every week. You created a heroin addict, like you're responsible for your daughter's heroin addiction, so we, you know, I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Thanks that's why that. she's and, on and here. And I think the important part about it, unfortunately, <laughs> so, uh, it, it, unfortunately, we have known people that, unfortunately, and and and, and, and people that we, we, we are near and dear to us that haven't survived this. Yes. And um, you're, the question is always to, to family members, what what did I do wrong? What could I have done? And, uh, and I think even telling those stories, and I know there's, there's levels of addiction and there's levels of use that are, that are you know, more extreme than others, obviously, but telling those stories, at some point, if you just reach them, maybe we can get them back. And I, I've, I've been involved in it, and obviously not as much as you two have, but... Um, you know, seeing it and walking into a room. When I first started out, we did, uh, I did a, um, a, I hate to even call it a tour of, of uh, treatment places and recovery places. And we sat down and we talked, we went to the hospital, we went to um, uh, treatment facilities, we went to recovery facilities, we sat down with family members, we sat down and talked um, to people that have been affected by this. And walking into that room and seeing these, you know, young individuals and then Two years later, you know, and they were down and out. And two years later, and I'm looking on my phone and I see on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, they have a successful business. They have a, a little one on the way or one there. It's just, it. there is light at the end of the tunnel for the, for, for. I don't share much people. in the way of my pictures when I was 25 or 26, which is when I stopped. But if you see pictures of me when I was 25 or 26, it's dramatically different from, it, it, it really is. And so you're right, you know, people can change. So as we get close to wrapping up, Billy, what, what can we do for you? Is there anything that you need from us in the recovery community to, you know, continue to talk to you about? What, what is it that we could do as a... I know? would say continue telling the story. And I know that just sounds cliche, but um, getting to people and telling that story, um, telling those stories, because like we said, treatment then recovery is an, an ongoing process and you I didn't like I said I didn't understand completely I still don't understand completely about what what it takes to get people um, help or what it takes to get people 
um, through that recovery process. Recovery is an everyday process yep. for, for the it's for a the, lifetime for, for the rest it's of your a, life. It's not. Um, a, yeah. it, but just honestly telling those stories to people that can make that policy as well, um, my colleagues, and to keep, you know, and also being positive about it. Um, whenever we are we're we're at events, we we try to be as positive. Uh, I know you. Uh, you are um, to try to be as positive as we can to say that there is light at the end of the t- tunnel. Don't. Did you hear him say I was positive? <laughs> Did you well, hear that? That was good. I, I kind of. That. It was kind of. Uh, <laughs> that was great. Kind of, tell you. kind of threw me off the way you were looking. You're like. <laughs> I'm, I'm positive. I'm positive. I'm like the sunshine of life today. Yeah, but just to say, you know, to get the, you know, uh, to uh, get the stigma away from this a little bit. There's always. It's always going to be there. It's always going to be there within within people's own families, you know. Uh, but I think we're making progress towards that, and to see that there is, um, there are success stories out there. Whenever we go to, whenever we have um, these interactions, these events, we make sure, you know, you do it on a regular basis to make sure that there are positive outcomes in there. And I think in years past, when when people, and I don't think we did that as much, um, when people would go to these. Um, events and not blaming it in any particular group, law enforcement or, or treatment specialists or whatever, at the end of it, the story was not a good story. Right. Right. Um, let's face it, it wasn't. And that's not a knock on anybody. Right. It just wasn't. It was like, this is what's going to happen. Um, well, I think people today have made, have made recovery more fun. We've yeah. made it, we've made it, it used to be that, oh, that poor guy can't do anything anymore because he's an, he's an addict. Yeah. And, and now yeah. we're saying, look, the life, my life is great today. Yeah, and like you even tell the know? story about what you uh, just recently, um, being over at MHAB, saying uh, the fun that you have had, um, you know, there are things that you can do. Absolutely. Um, and you said, obviously, uh, you know, you've had your struggles, um, but um, your life is much better than it was when you were when you were 25 years yeah. old. Yeah, my life You know was what I think is enjoyable. interesting? I think that people have, in in years past, have taken recovery addiction and they've tried to they've tried to sensationalize it by that you know those kind of dark stories of doom and gloom that yeah. you know you want to you want to embed. Stay this away fear from that. Stay as away. As opposed to yeah. talking about really what the other side of recovery is yeah. that you know addiction is a path that nobody wants to go down and it is dark. I mean yeah. it really is, but it doesn't need to be sensationalized. I think we can sensationalize recovery in right. a way that shows it as a as a place to go even from your darkest point you can get to this place and and you are the sunshine of our lives. <laughs> it's got to be the Two sweatshirt. Two compliments today, today right? it's the sweatshirt. <laughs> this oh. is my third caustic sweatshirt. So would would you be willing to come back and see us again? Absolutely. Update us maybe yes. once or twice a year. Yes. We'll have you on as a regular yeah, and you absolutely. can just kind of keep us absolutely. in the loop for and what's we, going we, on we in We have Albany to continue and, and I will say this, we as, as a group and we as you as the recovery community, I keep saying we, but I feel um, connected um, to it, but we have to continue. We think you're not. We think of yeah. you as a kind of an honorary. Yeah, member. you yeah. might be a normie, but you're an honorary <laughs> member of we, <laughs> the recovery community. We have to continue to push policymakers and um, lawmakers like myself to see that this uh, to, to to make sure that we make um, better and more efficient policy. And I think you w- will admit this. Um, you're not the biggest fan of, of of government, Michael, but we need to make sure that. Um, they are doing the right thing as far as as far as funding, but they're not being detrimental to the process as far as um, mandates and other um, uh, things that can be imposed that will hurt in that process. Right. Don't so, get in the way of what you yes. know. Do, help us. Let's everybody work together and help yeah. us. So sure. I would say thank you for coming today. We're we're very appreciative. Thank you. And, Love uh, having you. Yeah. That and wasn't I, that bad. Right? I would we're say, not that painful. <laughs> please continue. You know, just being the supporter that you have been for well, the years that I've known you, and it, it really is appreciated by me. And I don't speak on behalf of the recovery community, but I know a lot of people, and and we're very appreciative to have this kind of representation in in our district. So I'd like to thank, thank Billy you. Jones for coming and talking with us today. I would ask you in closing to go and check our website, mhab.org. Visit, see what we do at the MHAB Life Skills Campus. And uh, if you have suggestions, there are ways to put suggestions on the website. And uh, thanks again, Billy, for being here. And we'll see you in a couple weeks. About the closing. COVID out. That's not. (laughs) (laughs) 
We got to come up with a general closing. I don't know what the hell to say for closing. COVID out is my best closing that I have. Thanks for joining us today at Recovery Uncovered. No matter where you are in your recovery journey, or if you're supporting the recovery journey of a loved one, just know today is the first day of the rest of your life. Visit our website at mhab.org. And if you want to become an old timer in recovery, don't use and don't die. This has been Recovery Uncovered. <laughs>